Dang it. Dang it. Dang it. Oh, wait. Sorry, this video is not about trials? Uh, hang on, let me fix that. That's right, we're talking about Halo 4 today. Uh, so what I wanted to show you about this is... Um, that's odd, none of my controls are working. Oh, right, because Halo 4 didn't come out for PC till 2020, and this laptop from 2006 definitely can't run it. We would have to play this on Xbox 360 if I was gonna do a video about it, which is, of course, what I'm doing. So what trickery is afoot here? Welcome to episode five of Quick Start, a show about fast booting built-in operating systems from the malaise era of the personal computer, the mid to late 2000s. If you want the full backstory, you can watch the previous episodes, but it's not necessary. The most important thing to know is that circa 2007, a lot of computers, especially low-end ones, started to take a really long time to boot partly because hard drives were slow and SSDs weren't common yet, and partly because Windows got a lot bigger when Vista came out. PC builders mostly just ignored this problem and let computers be slow and awful for a few years, but some tried to solve it. They couldn't make Windows faster though, and they wouldn't sell you better hardware for the same price, so the most common fix was to offer a second operating system that you could boot into instead of Windows. Now, this series has already made it past the galactic barrier. We started with a laptop from Sony that took four minutes to boot Windows, or 30 seconds to boot its special little Linux, but all it could do once you got there was play DVDs. Not too exciting. We also saw Asus ExpressGate, an incredibly bare-bones Linux distro that was built into millions of motherboards, probably including one you owned, you just didn't notice it because you didn't care. Neither did anyone else. We also got a chuckle out of Dell's bizarre solution where they shipped two copies of Windows on the same machine. Boy, Jimmy, why is your mom let you have two licenses? Finally, we collectively wet ourselves when we saw Samsung and Phoenix band together to deliver a machine that didn't just dual boot Windows and Linux, but ran them both at the same time in a horrifying Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde nightmare. So this series has been a roller coaster. That, that's on purpose, I designed it that way. And there's plenty more to see that'll blow your mind, but let's take a little detour into the mundane. This episode breaks all the rules. It takes place well before Vista came out on a fairly well-equipped laptop, and in a shocking break from the trend, its Quick Start OS actually does boot quickly and serves a purpose. It's hard to believe, I know, but we'll get there. First though, a question. Have you ever found yourself needing a monitor in a pinch for something like testing a game console, but you didn't have one around, but you did have a laptop? It's probably happened. You're sitting there looking at the 1080p display that's right in front of you with the HDMI port right next to it, and you're wondering why that port doesn't go both ways. Why can't you just plug your PS5 into your laptop and use it as a display? Well, let's not mince words here. If you were in the right place at the right time, you could. A few laptops actually offered this. I can only name a couple, the Alienware M18 and M17, and Dell made like four revisions of those, so the model numbers are useless. They also didn't seem to make any kind of marketing noise about this capability. It's really hard to figure out which machines could actually do it. And that makes you wonder why they even did it at all. I mean, it's a cool feature, sure, but if they weren't gonna make a big deal out of it, what's the point? I never understood why companies will put in the work to add a feature that needs R&D, that, that requires actual effort, just to drop it after six months. If their goal wasn't to make it a selling point for their brand, then what was it? I also don't know why this is such a rare feature. It seems simple. I mean, LCD panels aren't as easy to connect as a normal monitor, but that's only from a consumer perspective. As a manufacturer, it's trivial. You can glue any panel to just about any input with one or two converter chips. Costs a few bucks, it's nothing. You need the ability to switch between internal and external sources, but that's been common in laptops with dual GPUs since the mid-2000s. These are solved problems. I'm sure it would add a few bucks to the cost of the machine, but if you're spending several thousand dollars on a high-end laptop, how could it not be worth it? Now you can, of course, add any input you like with a capture card, but besides being a dongle that you have to tote around, you also have to display that input somehow, and that sucks. You're gonna have to power up the PC, boot Windows, start OBS or whatever, and then you usually just get your picture in a little window. Because modern capture cards aren't really meant for watching stuff. They're intended to be plugged into OBS Studio or vMix so you can stream to Twitch or YouTube. In other words, they're tools for professionals to do their jobs, not for consumer recreation. So you have to take steps to make the video full screen and to get the sound to come out of your speakers and all that. 
This didn't used to be the case. Back in 2002, you could buy a TV tuner card in just about any store, plug in an antenna, and tune in a TV broadcast with software that was intended for watching TV on your PC. It was kind of janky, but it was at least fit to purpose. It defaulted to outputting audio. You could easily full screen it. It came with a remote. You could set channel presets, etc. It was definitely a consumer product, but as far as I can tell, this really isn't much of a market anymore. Hopog, maker of cards like the Win TV that I had in 2002, used to be the first name that came up when you Googled capture cards. Now they only come up if you specify TV tuner and yeah, look at this screenshot for their website and tell me that picture isn't a decade old. I'm sure Hopog still sell this product, but I doubt they've really touched it in any way in about that long. And sure, you could say broadcast TV hasn't changed in that long either, but usually companies keep iterating. With the diminishing popularity of broadcast TV in general and the proliferation of proliferation with the diminishing popularity of broadcast TV in general and the proliferation of streaming video boxes, I doubt that many people want to watch TV through their PCs anymore. Circa 2006, however, when this laptop came out, I'm having a stork. You spell burnt toast? Circa 2006, however, when this laptop came out, none of those things had happened yet. People mostly still watched TV in those days, and they mostly watched it on TVs, either free to air or over cable or satellite, all of which were still largely standard definition. Maybe a third of the US owned HDTVs and the analog shutdown wouldn't begin in the US for years. So the millions of television sets made since the 1930s and the VCRs and the capture cards, it was all still state of the art. Even with the year of Windows Vista on the desktop looming, we had not yet reached the beginning of the end of people carrying tiny black and white Sony TVs around to watch the game. Plenty of households still had huge tube TVs or even projection sets because LCDs were still pretty expensive. A 40 inch 720p model could still run you a thousand dollars even on Black Friday, and you wouldn't be able to walk into Goodwill and pick up a 15 inch model for 30 bucks for at least another decade. Most people just didn't have flat screens yet at all. What they did have, however, were TiVos, which solved a long-standing problem with television. You couldn't watch something until it was broadcast. Everyone had hated that since TV got going back in the 30s, and devices like the TiVo let you make your own little video-on-demand service to alleviate the pain. Actual video-on-demand hadn't yet gotten off the ground. Netflix was still just a DVD rental company who wouldn't launch a streaming service for another year. Hulu didn't show up for another two years, and everybody else took nearly a decade. And so, Irritating as it may be that you can't view arbitrary inputs through your laptop today, there were far more reasons to want to do that with a laptop 16 years ago. And believe it or not, a number of companies rose to the challenge and met it. You probably just didn't notice. It's okay, neither did I. I'm talking about laptops with TV tuners built in. I was surprised to learn there were a bunch of these. I knew it was possible, a card bus and USB capture cards have existed since time immemorial, and I knew, for instance, that HP bundled tuner cards with a bunch of their laptops, but I never saw it built into one until now. This is a Toshiba Quasmio G35 AV600, and while most of the quick start machines that I found are deadly boring in themselves, this one actually has a lot worth discussing. Uh, I actually had to trim this script down by over 30%, because I just kept wanting to talk about things and it just ballooned to an hour and a half. But this machine actually had some thought behind it. Not entirely good thought, but you know, since when did I care about that? The first thing I need to point out though, uh, although I doubt I really need to point it out, is that it's a dreadnought. This is a 17 inch laptop, which is the perfect size. I don't think they should make laptops smaller than that, but I've handled a lot of 17 inch laptops and this is the biggest one. It, it it really doesn't come across on camera. This thing is huge. It's also a good two inches thick. That actually makes it chunkier than like a Pentium machine from the mid nineties. I'm honestly not sure why this is so thick. I mean, I can sort of get why the base is so big, but I don't see why the screen had to be. The actual LCD panel is only gonna be like a quarter inch thick. So I think this is mostly useless airspace, but still, this thing weighs over 10 pounds, so trust me, there's stuff in there. I don't think it'll surprise you uh, that it cost a pretty penny. This was about $2,300 new. I actually wish I could have gotten the one that came out six months later, the AV660, because that would have been the most expensive machine I'd ever owned at $3,500 MSRP. But, you know, it might sting for some of us to hear this, but inflation calculations from the mid-2000s to now are almost as shocking as comparing to the 1980s, so, 
I regret to inform you that $2,300 in 2006 was actually pretty close to $3,200 nowadays. That's the kind of price tag you don't get near until you're looking at an i9 and a 4090. So yeah, this thing still costs quite a bundle. And despite that price tag, it's not all that impressive on its face. This machine only sports a 1.8 gigahertz core duo. Core, not Core 2. This is a 32-bit machine. It also has a GeForce Go 7300, which was not the RTX of its day, to put it mildly. To give you an idea, CNET's review said they only got 7 FPS in Doom 3. Although I'm not really sure how they made it run that poorly. I got more like 20. Listen, buddy, you don't have clearance for this area. Move along. In any case, it wasn't hot, and there were contemporary laptops that could do 50 to 60 in the same tests. This just has a GPU that's one step above Intel HD graphics. It's even more embarrassing when you realize that this enormous display here is not HD. That's only 1440 by 900. So it's not like the GPU is pushing that many pixels. It's actually another reason I wish I'd found an 8660. That thing had a full 1920 by 1200 display, which is always delightful on a machine this old, but the whims of eBay are what they are. So with this being the most desk eclipsing machine I've ever handled, I tend to think of it as being in the desktop replacement class, but I'm not sure what desktop that would have been. The CPU ain't that impressive, the GPU ain't that impressive, the display sure ain't that impressive. So who was this machine for? That's easy, the 20 year old television pirate of 2006. This is a multimedia system, a specific class of laptop that used to exist and I don't think it does anymore. Nowadays, people are very used to watching TV and movies on eight inch tablets or even more horrible little screens. For instance, I know a lot of you are watching this video on your phones in portrait mode, crushing my beautiful 4K face down to the size of a Band-Aid and I forgive you. In 2006, however, people had not yet normalized this and they expected to be able to see what they were watching. So the idea was that you might want to buy a laptop specifically for watching TV and movies. And that didn't require the hottest hardware specs because HD pretty much hadn't happened yet. I mean, it was there, HD TV existed, but Blu-ray didn't drop until the end of 2006. So everyone was still buying DVDs at this time. Most TV broadcasts were still in standard def. Uh, since online streaming didn't quite exist yet, even if you were a pirate, there just weren't any sources for HD content. Pretty much everything was 480p at best, and PCs had mostly been able to handle that for like five plus years. Uh, for the same reason, a high resolution screen wasn't nearly as important as one that was enormous, very clear, and incredibly bright, and this one nails all three. Maximum PC actually said this was the brightest screen they'd ever seen on a laptop, on par with a proper LCD television, and I'm inclined to agree. I've actually just been informed by my girlfriend, I've unlocked another memory, that in this era, they re-released Terminator 2 on DVD and it came with an HD encode of part of the movie on the disc that you could play in your PC. We might actually have a copy of that. If we do, I'll, I'll put that on the screen. No. Anyway, while a 17 inch display was a postage stamp next to the largest TVs of the era, a cheap portable set was still only gonna be about 15. So if you were going away to college and you needed something on which to view your legitimately obtained 480p DivX TV shows in your miserable cramped little dorm room, this machine would have been perfect. And this intent can be seen everywhere. Uh, for instance, while a DVD player was standard equipment for the time, the one in this machine is a slot loader. Now, most PC laptops used a silly pop-out drawer. It always felt really chintzy. I think this is a better solution, if a, a bit more failure prone. But more importantly, it makes us feel more like a device than a computer. It's also another reason I wish I'd been able to find an AV660 because that one had an HD DVD drive. I have a few of those, but it would be fun to have one in a laptop. Come to think of it though, I don't think they ever released Master and Commander on that format, so I don't know what use I'd have for it. Okay, here's another thing. On the side, We've got a headphone jack, and then we have another headphone jack. This makes a lot of sense. This machine is so big that you might actually have watched TV with somebody on it. Obviously, it was best if you could both hear. Curiously, however, this middle jack doubles as a SPDIF digital audio output. It uses one of those weird 3.5 millimeter fiber cables, just in case you're stuck watching a movie on your laptop, but you also have a high-end stereo receiver. I mean, we've all been there. On the back, you'll also find a variety of video outputs. Uh, VGA was standard for the time since HDMI wasn't really a thing on PCs yet, and DVI was never very common on laptops at all. 
but also because most flat screen TVs at the time had VGA inputs. S video output was also very common, both on consumer machines for watching video through a standard deaf TV, but also on business machines for connecting to digital projectors. What I've never seen on a laptop, however, is this guy here. Now, if you're a retro nerd, you might think that that's digital flat panel, which is an interface for LCD monitors that predated DVI. But by 2006, DFP was pretty much dead as far as I know, and I actually have a DFP cable here, and you can tell it's about twice the width. This port is actually called D-Terminal. That's a component video interface that was all over Japanese electronics. You'd find it on receivers, TVs, all sorts of things. Uh, in fact, my Canon XL-H1 camcorder uses the same thing for its component outputs. Now, maybe these were common on Japanese laptops, I'm not sure, but I suspect it's on here because Toshiba figured you'd wanna plug this machine into your TV, and an awful lot of people still had late model high-end CRTs where component was the best you could ask for. All of that, plus the huge aluminum volume knob, the gigantic Harman Kardon speakers, the prominent playback controls, make it clear that this machine is for media. But the stars of the show are on this back corner here. First, we've got the antenna input here for the inbuilt TV tuner. And then around on this side, we've got another S-Video jack for input this time instead of output. And then there's a 3.5 millimeter jack that accepts a TRRS cable to input composite video and stereo sound. So when I said that this had a built-in tuner, I didn't mean that it shipped with a card that you stuck in the expansion slot on the side. I mean, it's literally built in. There's a cover on the bottom you can open to see that card. It's a little mini PCI job. It's got the micro coax for the antenna. It's got all these wires for the other inputs. It really is built in. Now, like I said, TV tuners have been getting increasingly common for years, so even if this is an unusual way to see it done, the technology was actually getting very mature. That means that while my Win TV card back in 2002 required some janky software, by 2006, you could just use Windows itself. We'll need to fire this machine up to make that point, but we'll have to make a couple detours along the way because this thing has some quirks I'd like to show you. For instance, Yes, it has a startup cinematic. Now, uh, before we continue, <laughs> I just wanna say, I'm guessing that you're hearing the awful electrical and fan noise this machine is making, and I have bad news. You may be hearing that for the entire video. I tried taking this apart to at least clean out the CPU fan, but it's got like three mezzanine boards in there. If I'd persisted, I would've just torn a ribbon cable in half and, and ruined the machine. Besides that, I could not have fixed the warbling coming from the LCD inverter, which is probably the worst of it, so it is what it is. If the noise drives me batshit during editing, though, I might have to filter it out, in which case, that's why my voice sounds really muffled now. I sure do love old computers. I definitely picked the right job. Anyway, as I said in the last video, the overwhelming majority of PC clones ever made used BIOS code developed by one of three companies, American Megatrends, Award, or Phoenix. But in the early days, there were some vendors who developed their own. The first 100% compatible from Compaq, in fact, used a BIOS they wrote themselves, but most manufacturers didn't have that skill set and had to buy them from someone else. If you go late enough, even Compaq gave up and started buying third party, but from what I gather, Toshiba hung on to their BIOS for a really long time. So, if we get into the BIOS setup on this machine. Even if you know nothing about retrocomputing, you can tell the stink of the 80s is all over this thing. It looks prehistoric, and it basically is. This interface shipped on Toshiba's going back to at least 1990. That's 16 years, and maybe even longer. It is truly bizarre to see stuff about virtualization and multiprocessing in an interface I associate with 386s, but the strangeness hits its peak if you go to the last page of the config where you set up the RAID array. This machine has two hard drive bays. Each one takes a normal two and a half inch SATA drive, and that in itself is not unusual. There were tons of desktop replacements and workstations that did this. In fact, some even had dual optical drives for some reason. It was a strange time. In most machines, I think both drives just ran as ordinary separate units. But in this one, you can get into the BIOS and either stripe or mirror them together through an actual hardware RAID controller. I'm not sure why you'd do this, but you can. 
Nonetheless, this firmware is laughably outdated. Toshiba actually canned it pretty much right after this machine. By 2007, they were using Phoenix like everybody else, but they did lose a little bit of personality in the process. I doubt Phoenix offered an option for adding a boot up animation with a sound effect, so that went away. Uh, but also, Toshiba's firmware always had an incredibly charming boot menu. Right after the boot logo, it shows this little array of icons down here, and those are all your possible boot devices. You can just tap the arrows to select whichever one you want. Oh my fing god, honey. Well, that was just there since. F whatever, I'll lampshade it. I'll put some text up. At least I'm staying hydrated. Proof of hydration. This is incredibly cute, but it's not actually a good UI. <laughs> There's no text to identify these things, so if you had, say, three USB drives plugged in, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. That might be moot, though, because I'm not even sure this supports USB boot, which is absurd for 2006, and pretty much tells us why we should be glad that in-house firmware isn't common. Still, it's always fun to see a PC that did something different. But anyway, let's see this thing boot. That took about 30 seconds, so there's no question. This machine does not have a slow boot problem. And why should it? It doesn't run Vista. It had the special little sticker that said it was Vista compatible, and since it came with a gig of RAM, that was actually true, but it was on the market for nearly a year before Vista came out. So what most owners would have experienced was Windows XP Media Center Edition, which is what we have here. This is, in no uncertain terms, just Windows XP, a five-year-old OS that would run comfortably on a Pentium 3 with 256 megs of RAM. It's just been enhanced with a couple silly little bells and whistles, and then one big whistle called Windows Media Center. If you watched the Dell Media Direct episode, nothing this does will shock you. Media Center is exactly what it sounds like. It's a big, integrated player that makes your PC act like a piece of AV gear. Uh, like a DVD player, something you'd plug into your TV and then use from your couch. So when you start it, it immediately goes full screen with huge text you can see from 10 feet away. All the options are things you'd want to do from your living room. So I can put in a DVD, for instance, go to play DVD, and away it goes. <laughs> Was from news of my arrival and it'll stay dead of course you'd then want to control this from your couch so media center pcs usually came with remote controls so you never had to get up this machine was no exception and sure enough i can control playback with any remote bearing the big green windows logo naturally this also has a picture viewer and it has a video file player and it has a music player. And of course, it can do live TV, which is what we came here for. Now, I tried to shoot this video once before, but I had to stop because I'd accidentally written 4,000 words about how rough the Media Center experience is. And that turned out not to be very much fun. So to save you a lot of time, I cannot demo this doing what it did when it was new. Analog TV is dead, and since I don't even have a compatible antenna cable, there's no way to feed it an RF signal. The TV tuner has other inputs, that's what I'm using right now, but Media Center really doesn't want to use them. I figured out how to force it to, but the experience is not great. In short, however, Media Center's TV features were a clone of the massively popular TiVo product, which would let you view TV shows, look at a graphical guide to what's on, record shows, record them on a schedule if you liked, play them back whenever you wanted, and finally, you could pause live TV, so you could go for a bathroom break without missing anything. Media Center does all of that. Not very well, but it does it. I think if I reach over here, I think I can just hit 
pause. There we go. So this is basically a TiVo, and it wasn't unique by any means. This first came out in 2002, and there'd always been commercial competitors to it, often with more functionality. You could even use XBMC on Linux or a modded Xbox for free, and those could do a lot more as well. The point, though, is that you didn't need to do any of that. You could just go out and buy a machine like this with all the necessary integrated hardware and the preloaded software that wasn't hyper janky third party crap. So effectively, you just bought an entire entertainment system that came with a free computer attached. If you weren't a nerd, that was pretty cool. If you were, you probably wouldn't touch this with a 10 foot pole. I've heard that most computer people thought that XP Media Center was hot garbage. I obviously have some negative opinions too, but what's important is that this element of the Cosmio is not remotely special. There were dozens of machines on the market with Media Center that did everything this does. So if I reviewed this, I'd just be reviewing XP Media Center and that's a separate video. As usual for this series, to see what actually makes this special, we actually have to turn it off. If we look above the keyboard here, we've got some media keys. You know, you got your play, pause, your next, previous, etc. And then we have these two shortcut buttons. Now, normally those would open Windows Media Center and go to the live TV or the music player sections. But if I hit live TV now, And suddenly we're watching live TV with only about 10 seconds of delay. We're also watching over that composite input that I said Windows Media Center refused to use. This is happy to use it, but of course we aren't in Windows anymore. What we're running here is Cosmio Player, a special Linux distro from Toshiba that loads the absolute minimum set of modules and drivers so it can boot as quickly as possible. And then instead of a desktop environment, it launches a Media Center app, which instantly connects to the capture card, opens the last used input and puts it on the screen. And this is basically the quick start thesis. Nearly all the machines that I cover have one thing in common, two power buttons. The normal one boots into Windows, and then a second, funnier power button boots into this tiny Linux distro hidden in a secret hard drive partition or a special file buried in the Windows file system, and always with the same goal, to make the machine boot up faster. But wait, this machine already boots quickly. It doesn't run Vista. It's not affected by the slow boot crisis, assuming that ever really happened, which is beginning to look increasingly unlikely as this series continues. But at any rate, this is one of the earliest quick start OSs I'm aware of, but why did this machine even need a quick start option? Well, I think this justifies itself effortlessly and I'm gonna illustrate why and you're gonna agree with me. Imagine it's a normal day in 2006 and this happens. Oh shoot, house is coming on. All right, we missed the first 10 seconds of our show. That's a bummer. But now let's see what happens if we booted into Windows instead. Oh shoot, the house is coming on. First, we'll spend 40 seconds booting. Then we'll take another 20 seconds to launch Media Center and bypass the stupid mm. dialogue boxes. Then we'll spend 15 seconds waiting for it to do something. And now we're finally watching after a minute and 12 seconds. Throughout this series, I've struggled to justify any of these quick boot schemes. Usually the difference is only 30 to 40 seconds versus booting Windows even on a really slow machine. And most things you do on a PC, whether it's checking email or watching a movie, take so much longer than that, I don't think anyone ever would have really noticed the difference. But in the days before you could stream nearly every show online, if you missed the first minute of House MD, it was just gone. You might have missed some critical detail about the couple's crappy marriage or the scene where House steals Wilson's keys that sets up a bunch of conversations over the next 40 minutes, that sort of thing. You couldn't go back and get it. So if you decided to use a laptop as your primary TV, maybe because you're at a friend's house or you're out camping or you are in some shitty dorm where that's all you have room for, waiting over a minute for the goddamn thing to warm up could genuinely ruin your experience. In other words, if Toshiba wanted this to be a replacement for a TV, it needed to turn on as quickly as a TV did and it does. I'm usually very critical of uh, bonus features on PCs. My take is usually that they're good ideas implemented poorly. Or, or bad ideas implemented poorly more often. 
But what Toshiba's done here is in actual fact, incredibly slick and works really well. You heard it here first, folks. This is a quick start machine I actually like. Instead of being disappointing, awkward, and pointless, this actually makes it practical to use your laptop as a TV. It does everything it should as easily as it should. There's no computer bullshit, there's no pop-up dialogues, nothing. It just acts like a television. The IR remote even works. I mean, every part of it. If you're across the room, you just pick up the remote, hit the live TV button, and the machine will power on and boot up straight into TV mode. You can then channel surf, or punch in a channel number, and of course, change volume and mute right from your armchair or your crappy twin bed. Curiously, we can't switch to composite or S video inputs from the remote. I've tried every single button, none of them do it. So you have to walk over and hit the I key. That's, that's kind of a bummer. Like a TV, there's also a settings menu. And if we had a signal, we could have it auto scan for available channels to make surfing easier. The settings also offer picture adjustments and all the scaling options you'd hope for. You aren't gonna get stuck with a widescreen version of a 4.3 image or vice versa. It also supports closed caption decoding and would you look at that, recording. If we're in live TV mode and we just hit the record button on the remote, whatever you're watching instantly starts recording to the hard drive. This thing has about five gigs of storage and you can record at three bit rates from high quality to long play. Uh, this is all MPEG-2 and the settings correspond to eight, four, and two megabits respectively. That's about one to five hours of recording time. You can even check how much time is left from the settings menu. Playing stuff back on the laptop itself, I don't really notice a difference between the quality levels and especially if you plan to watch from a few feet away, you could probably get away with just the long play mode. So think of this as a TiVo with a five hour capacity. I taped a few things earlier, so if we hit the recorded TV button, we get this list of dates and times. Sadly, there was no program info signal built into NTSC television, so there's no names in this list, but if I'd been using the tuner, it would, at least would have told me which channel it was on. Uh, here, these all just show composite or S video. Uh, anyway, we can pick any clip here and pull that up. If we hit F1 during playback, you can see all these options down here for you know fast forward, rewind, instant replay, instant skip, which just skip forward or skip backward by a few seconds. Uh, and this is all available from the remote as well. So this functions very much like a TiVo so far, but the most important feature those had, according to many people anyway, was live pause. I figure it's possible that some people watching this have never had to put up with broadcast TV. So just in case, here's what that was. Having to wait for an ad break to go take a piss or get a snack was incredibly irritating but unavoidable with TV. One of TiVo's big features was that you could hit pause on your remote and it would begin recording but leave you at the first frame of the video. So you could get up and do whatever you needed to do then come back and hit play. You'd be five or 10 minutes behind the actual broadcast and then you could just watch at your own pace. Uh, pause and unpause whenever you liked, rewind to parts that had been recorded already or fast forward, uh, at least until you caught up with the actual broadcast. Back when I had a TiVo, I would actually go in when a show started and just hit pause and then walk away and do something else for 20 minutes. So when I came back, I'd be far enough behind that I could fast forward through all the ad breaks without catching up with the live broadcast. It was a pretty unpleasant time to be alive, but still everyone who had one of these adored it. So if Toshiba had left this functionality out, they'd have been doing half a job for sure. Well, when I first wrote this script, I said that the Cosmio didn't have this feature because I read the manual and there was no mention of it. I hit all the buttons on the remote and it still didn't pause. So I was gonna say that Toshiba very sadly and inexplicably snatched defeat from the jaws of victory here. But then I happened to hit F1 while watching TV and I noticed this shortcut for time shifting recording. Sure enough, hit control T and there it is. This indicator up here tells us uh, where we are versus how much video has been recorded. And just like you'd expect, uh, we can now pause this. We can rewind. We can fast forward. Uh, we can jump around in the recorded video exactly like a TiVo. Uh, we can even do all this stuff from the remote. Uh, all the controls work as you'd expect. And as I later learned by accident, you can enter live pause mode with the remote. You just don't do it by hitting anything sensible. You hit the pound sign. You can imagine I hadn't thought to try that one. So this is bizarre. Live pause was a really hot feature and Toshiba did include it, but they pretty much buried it. I don't get this. It's not like it was unfinished. It works perfectly. It's even in the help menu in the program. Just the manual doesn't mention it and the remote that came with the machine had no label for it. 
I mean, why put it on pound to begin with? Even if Toshiba couldn't add a new button to the remote and they had to overload it on an existing key, why not use pause? Pause doesn't do anything during normal viewing and it also makes sense. So this is just a bizarre decision. But ultimately, I like to think that most users would have discovered this feature. So I'm gonna call this a nearly full-featured, highly impressive DVR experience. One glaring omission, however, is the program guide. This doesn't have one, so all you can do is channel surf. But I think that's more defensible. Modern ATSC signals have a built-in digital guide feature, but NTSC never had that. So the only way to get any kind of TV schedule was with an online service. I don't blame Toshiba for not wanting to add networking to their instant on software. So I think this is an understandable omission, but it also means there's no way to program this thing to record a show on a schedule, which was definitely the biggest selling point of the TiVo. On the other hand, this being a laptop, Toshiba probably imagined that it would often be in a bag and unpowered and frequently connected to an iffy antenna anyway. So offering scheduled recording would come with a huge asterisk and an awkward explanation that it won't really work reliably unless you leave your machine plugged in, powered on, and connected to a rooftop antenna, which kind of defeats the purpose of, you know, a laptop. As a consolation prize, however, Cosmio Player also has a disc mode. If you put in a CD or a DVD, it'll switch automatically, uh, or you can get there by starting up with the third power button or by hitting the DVD key on the remote. Uh, but then the disc player works exactly like you'd expect. I have to wonder, actually, if this is literally software that Toshiba was shipping on consumer DVD players, since a lot of those were Linux-based. The remote works here too. We can play, pause, fast forward, we can go to the menu, we can navigate around, change the volume, you know, the whole bit. The CD player is even simpler. You get the track number, the time, that's it. Naturally, the remote works here too, and when you're done, you can even power the machine off by just hitting the power button. So, in summary, this thing really can replace your whole AV system. Your TV, your TiVo, and your DVD player all get condensed into one machine that also doubles as your personal computer. And Toshiba absolutely could have screwed this one up, but they pretty much didn't. Like I showed you during the intro gag, you could even plug your Xbox 360 in and play Halo through it. In fact, the commenter who put me onto this thing in the first place implied that's exactly what he did. So, like I said, I think any college kid who got one of these as a going away present probably adored it. As long as you stick to Cosmio Player, this thing behaves like an appliance, not a computer, and that is super cool. On that topic, let's talk a bit about how this works behind the scenes. There's not that much to it, but uh, there's a couple oddities. With most of the machines in this series, you install your operating system, like normal, then you run an installer to add the Quick Start OS. Cosmio Player does not work like this. You have to burn a disk from an installer ISO, boot from it, and then let it wipe your whole hard drive. The UI for this is kind of charming. You'd figure it would just be some text mode thing, but no, they actually made graphics for it. It looks like a finished product. Shocking. The reason it destroys everything on your hard drive is, of course, because it's repartitioning it so it can tuck Cosmio Player into its own little secret hiding place. And sure enough, once it's done, you can install Windows, but it sees the hard drive as completely empty. And then after it's installed, it still sees nothing but itself. The reason for this is that Cosmio Player leverages a feature we've mentioned before, the HPA or Host Protected Area, which lets it tell the hard drive to hide all sectors after a certain point, in this case about the 75 gig mark. As you can see, Windows thinks this is a 75 gig drive instead of 80, and that leaves around 5 gigs of space for Cosmio Player to live in, where nothing else can detect it. Of course, this isn't strictly true. HPA partitions can be read from software. You just have to know they're there and issue the right ATA commands to expose them. As far as I know, this requires admin permission, so most software can't do it, but the Toshiba BIOS can, as well as the Cosmio Player file copy utility. You can launch this from Windows and it'll show you all the clips you've recorded in Cosmio Player. You can then copy those to your normal Windows partition and even delete the originals. So, while I said this had a capacity of only five hours at best, in truth, you could fit nearly 80 hours of video on here. You just have to make sure you copy it out and clear it out regularly, which is tedious since the file copy tool is very bare bones and doesn't let you select multiple files at once. Also, you wouldn't be able to watch any of those extracted videos from within Cosmio Player since it has no option for playing local files from, say, your Windows partition or a USB drive, and you can't push files back to the Cosmio Player partition. But, you know, by the time you've recorded more than a few hours of media, you're probably trying to archive it anyway, and you can just play it from Windows if you want. 
Behind the scenes, this is of course very simple. Cosmio Player maintains a couple different hidden partitions. I'm not sure how it remembers where they are. I'm guessing there's some beer and parties nonsense going on where it has a secret partition table hidden in some unused part of the disc. But beyond that, these are just ordinary disc partitions. So I unlocked the HPA region with a Linux utility called HD Parm. Then I located those partitions with a data recovery tool. And sure enough, here's one that has all the OS files. And then here's another with all our recorded MPEGs. The Windows utility just points a Linux file system driver directly at the location of that partition and mounts it. This approach has several benefits. For one thing, the actual Cosmio Player OS is completely static. Once it's installed, it never gets touched again. And of course, the knee-jerk response is, but then it never gets updates. What about security? Well, here's a secret. Computers didn't need to get patched every six hours back before they were all connected to the internet 24-7. Cosmio Player has no network support at all, and it will not read any external storage device, only its own partitions. That means that if it works on day one, it'll keep working forever. It's a total data island. It has a driver for the TV tuner card, that's it. You can't add your own. You can't feed it external media files. It won't even play MP3s. You could feed it an adversarial DVD, but no, shush. This software deals entirely with data that it creates itself. It doesn't need to be updated. It's like a DVD player. It just works and it'll keep working forever, as long as NTSC broadcasts exist. But they'll never shut those. Since you literally cannot get access to the OS to break it, unless your hard drive dies, this is always going to power up when you hit the button on the remote, and it's always gonna take exactly the same amount of time. Several commenters over the course of the series have proposed that Quick Start OSs are valuable not because they boot faster than Windows per se, but because they're faster than a hosed up virus and botnet infested copy of Windows that's been fragmented to hell and back. Computer over. <laughs> Virus equals very, we did this before. Yeah. To be frank, I just don't think that PC vendors ever cared to acknowledge what happens to a PC eight months after it leaves the factory, so I kind of reject that take, but it is true that Windows gets slower over time, particularly back then. This was an era mostly before SSDs and before PCs could defragment themselves on the fly. Most people never did it at all, so even a very clean copy of Windows was gonna lose some steam as it got patched and so on. Since Cosmio Player never gets patched and you can't change the OS at all, even after years of use, it should always start up in exactly 10 seconds, just like new. Finally, storing your recordings on a dedicated partition avoids the need for Cosmio Player to touch the Windows file system. As I've addressed before, Linux NTFS drivers at this time were not as mature and reliable as they are now. Besides, if you put your machine to sleep or hibernate or you shut it down incorrectly, your Windows partition would become dirty. And even now, Linux is unable to safely mount a dirty partition. Its NTFS repair utilities at that time did more harm than good, so basically this would have been a laughably unreliable product. It would only work if you shut down Windows fully and correctly every time you used it and never forgot to charge your battery. Obviously not practical. I did want to address the battery, by the way, just because it's kind of comical. Uh, the power supply for this machine uses a gigantic proprietary four pin connector reserved for Toshiba's highest powered machines that's rated at 15 volts and eight amps or about 120 watts with this battery being only 48 watt hours that would have lasted like 15 minutes fully charged with those numbers even the battery in my 13 inch lenovo is bigger that said i'm not sure where all that power would have been going if we put the machine on a watt meter with the battery removed we draw about 60 to 70 watts during boot around 44 idling at a desktop about 50 to 60 when playing a dvd and around 70 when playing a game all those figures are about the same, whether we're in Windows or Cosmio Player. So there's like 40 to 50 watts missing here, and I'm honestly not sure where that would have gone. When I first discovered the RAID feature, I thought that might be it, but it turns out that a single SATA hard drive pulls maybe three to five watts, so that's not it. And I thought maybe battery charging current, but I doubt that given the comically small capacity of this pack. Honestly, I think Toshiba only included a battery out of a sense of necessity. Neither Maximum PC nor Cena even bothered to mention battery life. I mean, I doubt they tested it. Who would? What's the scenario where you'd even try using this thing untethered? And this might explain why the battery is unusual. If we unlock it and pop it out, you might notice there's no label. That's because you have to separate these two parts. That's the actual battery pack. This 
it's just a plate. And I think the reason for that is that this battery is so useless that Toshiba figured you might wanna just take it out to save weight, but that would leave a hole here where this chunky AV receiver foot was. So you can separate these, then reinstall the plate so the machine sits level. This is actually really cool. I've never seen anybody else try to solve this problem. So this is a peculiar machine in a few ways, but I think it mostly explains itself. My question is, why did Toshiba bother shipping this with Windows Media Center? I mean, it has some extra functionality. It sports scheduled recording, local media playback and whatnot, but that's all stuff Toshiba could have replicated. They clearly had the skills. I've been through the binaries. I've looked through the error messages and the function names that are embedded in there, and I haven't found the names of any other companies. No inner video or cyberlink, just things that suggest that this was genuinely an in-house Toshiba product. Again, they were probably writing their own DVD player firmware. They obviously had developers who knew how to write media player software, and with that skill set, they could have made the Windows experience on this machine much better. Again, I don't want to spend 20 minutes hating on Windows Media Center. It honestly deserves more, but here's a couple examples. Remember how I told you that all Media Center PCs supported these universal IR remotes? Yeah, that was sort of true. This remote works, but not with the built-in IR receiver. Instead, you have to use one of these dongles that came with every Media Center PC. This thing has about 20 feet of cable hanging off of it, and it's one of those super lightweight gadgets that you have to tape down to a surface or the weight of the cable will whip it into orbit. This laptop may not be terribly portable, but now it's even less so. If you wanna use the Windows side of the software, you can't just plunk this on a desk and plug it into the wall and get going. You gotta figure out where to stick this bastard, and you gotta figure out what to do with 20 feet of cable. This isn't just a software problem either. The built-in receiver doesn't even show up in Device Manager. There's no driver on Toshiba's site. I have no idea what's wrong here, but it's only useful in Cosmio Player, and I blame Microsoft. It has to be their fault. Media Center is also slow. Over 30 seconds of the time wasted when starting up in Windows to watch TV is spent waiting for Media Center to load and become responsive. Usually when I start it, it lands on a dead channel, then begins emitting deafening static and won't respond to volume or mute controls for a good 25 seconds. I can't even close it. The other modes aren't quick either. Pretty much everything this does takes multiple seconds to respond. Media Center's live TV experience is also not very smooth. Uh, for instance, I mentioned earlier that it can't really use composite or S-video inputs. It, it just won't. There is no option for that unless you lie and say that you have a cable or a satellite box. You feel clever for a moment, and then it demands you connect a thing called an IR blaster so it can communicate with that box. It won't let you just do it yourself. It wants total control. The blaster functionality is fortunately built into the standard media center receiver, but even then, it checks to see if you actually plugged in the IR transmitter dongle. If not, it still won't let you use those inputs. It's just draconian. This experience sucks, and it really seems like Toshiba was in a great place to solve it. They, they could have shipped XP home, then taken the money they saved on licensing and put it into improving Cosmio Player. They could have added TV guide functionality, maybe uh, load it periodically from an online service via a companion app that runs inside Windows. That's the sort of thing that a lot of these quick start machines do. That way they wouldn't have to touch the network. And since they had a custom in-house BIOS, they could have added scheduled recording that wakes the machine up for a moment, checks to see if it's receiving a signal. If so, it records the show then shuts itself back down. That's cool. Uh, they certainly could have developed a Windows native version of Cosmio Player like Cyberlink did with their Media Direct app for Dell. I mean, the list goes on. Toshiba was in total control here. Why stop where they did? Why not go the distance? I think they were really well positioned to make a serious Media Center competitor. And in my opinion, 2006 was a great year to sell a laptop that doubled as a full function AV stack. TiVo was a name on everyone's lips. Standard Def Video was still generally accepted. PCs were powerful enough to encode and decode MPEG-2 and even MPEG-4 in real time. Hard drives were big enough to store huge amounts of recorded TV without cramping the user's style. This was a slam dunk. Why'd they stop short of the finish line? The whole thing feels incredibly well executed up to a point. And that feels like it's just Cosmio in general. I know I can't speak for everyone here. I'm frequently oblivious to these things, but I'd never heard of a Cosmio in my life until I got that comment. And it just described it as a laptop that could function as a TV. So I spent two days Googling for this and I found nothing. I never found any mention of this machine until I came back and asked him for the model name. It's like these things never existed.
I've tried to find out how many other Cosmios had this functionality, but it's pretty hard to search for. So I can't be sure that Toshiba didn't do a better job later on. Maybe they sold a machine in 2009 that could tune in ATSC and had full DVR functionality complete with the guide. I'd love to find one if so, but I suspect that it wouldn't end up being a part of this series. By that time, a few years later, with the improvements in CPU speed and the release of Windows 7, anything like this would have just been a normal Windows app, I'm sure. Honestly, I haven't even put Vista's version of Media Center through its paces. Maybe it did a better job and made this all irrelevant. Or maybe since Windows got faster and more reliable, other companies started offering apps that Toshiba didn't feel like competing with. Because Cosmios were not the only machines with built-in tuners. This was apparently a phenomenon that I missed entirely. I knew all about laptops having TV out, but never TV in. I worked in eCycle for years. I don't remember ever seeing one like this, but there were actually quite a few. It seems like the earliest ones came out in 2005. That included the first Cosmios. Uh, but for instance, I also learned that Sony shipped the Vio VGN AX570G with a TV tuner option. Now that's kind of cheating because it wasn't quite built in, but it wasn't really an add-in card either. It was a replacement for the optical drive. You would pull the CD-ROM out and put this in. It's got one of those uh, like Ultra Bay type ports on the back. There's your uh, inputs on the front. It even had this little holder here for the adapter that would convert the funky micro coax plug into a standard F connector. It's very cute, although <laughs> perhaps not quite on point. So I think Toshiba might have had the first machine with a proper built-in tuner, uh, but there were others. Uh, for instance, uh, a little later, Alienware had them on the M7700, the M17X, and the M15X. Uh, Samsung apparently sold a Q30, among other models. And while all of those, as far as I can tell, just used normal Windows software, at least one company made machines that also used their own Quick Boot OS. Fujitsu Instant My Media, apparently included in the Lifebook N6200 series, was uh, seemingly very much like this. Those are rare enough I couldn't even find a screenshot to show you, but maybe I'll get a hold of one for a future episode. Who knows? And of course, this didn't stop in 2006 either. A couple years later, Sony sold the VGN AW180 with a built-in tuner, and it was still going on at least as late as 2011 when Asus sold their N53 SV. That one, of course, supported HDTV, and I'm sure there were others that did as well. It's just hard to collect all this info because TV tuners have never been the sort of thing that nerds get hype about online. They've been around since the late 90s, but never that much of a nerd darling, never a huge selling point for a PC either. Even when broadcast TV was still very much in vogue, when the TiVo was still a huge name, the only people I remember really caring were the Linux Myth TV crowd, who were very much the tip of the enthusiast iceberg, because it was always incredibly irritating to set that crap up. I once spent two-thirds of a Monk marathon trying to get Myth TV working, and I finally just gave up and watched Monk instead. Nonetheless, while I'm sure this machine was not the only one that ever did what it does, I think it'll probably be the last multimedia machine we'll see in Quick Start. The rest of the devices on the docket are pretty much all focused on productivity, making them even less interesting to almost all of us, and they're pretty much all worse at it than this one was. It's all downhill from here. But if you at least enjoyed this video, then don't forget to subscribe before you move on, so I know you're into this sort of thing. Remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I do more things. If you really enjoyed this, however, consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks here are doing. This entire series is only possible because they enable me to buy dumb crap on eBay that I hope will be interesting, that I hope will even work, actually, although I never know if it is or if it will until it gets here. They also enable me to eat and put gas in my car, so, you know, maybe that does something for you. At any rate, I'm incredibly grateful to all of them for making this all possible. Thank you all so much, and to everyone else, thanks for watching.